Your your movies after that, the three movies with Bill, Force of Arms, Submarine Command, huh. and, and Union Station, which I happen to think is not that bad a movie, but it, 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 well, I think it's a pretty good movie. Uh, was it so hard starting off where you had something where the bar was raised so high and then you were in these other films, I, I got the distinct impression they were not really what you wanted to do. No. And I, being under contract, uh, when we had Barbara Hale here the other night, she talked about the attributes of the studio taking care of you and providing for you and all of that kind of paternalistic stuff. But the other side of that coin is, hey, I want you to go make a movie or I'm Jack Warner and I'm calling your house kind of Yes, ratcheting the pressure. Up. Exactly. Um, you know, I don't think that there were so many movies being made then. I don't think that every one of them is going to be great. It depends on so many things. It is such an unusual coming together of script, performances, directing, music. Uh, that creates a work of art. And so you cannot do a work of art every time because it's, it's, all, it's, it's hard. Maybe if you're Picasso you can, but that, that's about it. The thing about this film is it tells a truth. And that is great art. And the truth is that the film business created stars as commodities. They were investments. And when you, they, they, they hyped you. You were made larger than life. You were not only sexy, you were the most sexy girl in the world, a la Marilyn Monroe. You were not only beautiful, you were the most beautiful girl in the world. You were the most interesting, you were the most fascinating. There's no such thing. So you became this commodity. And you were valuable. It's all about money. It still is. And when this film was shown to other industry leaders, Louis B. Mayer went over to Billy at a private screening and he shouted, how could you do this to us? exposed that pe the studios took advantage of vulnerable people like Norma Desmond and when they were through with them they threw them away in the meantime she bought what she was told that she was so there was this this was the tragedy of this film and by the way every single person was an opportunist in this film including me my character. I wanted to be an, a writer. I recognized that Joe Gillis was talented. I needed help. He could help me. And in the process, I fell in love with a man who had sold his soul to survive. But you were a wholesome opportunist. And, <laughs> and, and plus the fact, I'm so relieved that you did not, they did not have you going off and getting married to Jack Webb. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> um, the, and I believe that premiere, the story you talked about, L.B. Mayer, that um, I, I saw an interview with Gloria Swanson where she said Mary Pickford started crying and ran into the ladies' room at the screening. And I think the greatest compliment was that Barbara Stanwyck, who was there, knelt down in front of Gloria Swanson and kissed the hem of her dress at the end of the film. So that, that you know, you can't top that. It resonated. Yeah. But you have to understand that what happened is that I made Sunset Boulevard, uh, a picture with Bing Crosby. I was much too young. But I worked with one of the icons of the 20th century. And then another picture, Union Station, with Bill. And before any of these films were released, I married and moved to New York. And I said to Paramount, I don't really think I want to be a movie star. And they flipped out. They were so upset. Because, you see, they had an investment. They had put me in these movies to, to use me 
as starring, and that would bring people into the theater. Yeah. So they were extremely upset. Talk a little bit about your that part of your career and your marriage to Alan J. Lerner, um, including and especially My Fair Lady, and that, well, that part of your life. What It was so irresistible. I was only 21, and that's much too young, I think, really, to get married. But anyway, here was a man who had written Brigadoon, and he was a genius. He was a librettist working with Frederick Lowe, Fritz Lerner and Lowe, Fritz Lowe, and they had done Brigadoon, Alan had done Love Life with Kurt Weill. He was back with Fritz, he was going to do Paint Your Wagon when, while he was married to me, and then he did a movie with uh, Burton, La uh, Burton Lang and Fred Astaire at Royal Wedding, and then he did My Fair Lady, which he dedicated to me, and he did Gigi, two masterpieces, mm -hmm. and then he, we, we, we had two beautiful daughters, we have two beautiful daughters and three beautiful grandchildren, daughters, granddaughters, and, um, and then we were divorced. He married eight times. But you, you got the good years, right? <laughs> I, I did. But then I married Alan, I was single for, for four and a half, almost five years, and I did three plays on Broadway, and I worked for Mr. Disney. Pollyanna, the absent-minded yes. professor, remember? Yes. And that was fascinating. Fred, and, of course, Fred McMurray. And Fred McMurray, who yeah. also grew up in Wisconsin. That was nice. And uh, he, he, he was fabulous. I mean, he was so such a gifted comedian. Yeah. I mean, anything he did was so measured and right on the target. And anyway, then I married this wonderful, incredible, also genius, Alan Livingston, who created Bows of the Clown, remember that? And put Frank Sinatra with Nelson Riddle, and then left Capitol and, and created Bonanza, came back to Capitol, married me, signed the Beach Boys, the Beatles, the band, and uh, we have this wonderful son, Christopher Livingston, who's here, who's married to a wonderful wife, Carrie, and Madeline, and Graham. In, in eating lunch with you today, uh, and just listening to Nancy going through the known names of the second half of the 20th century, from Adlai Stevenson to John Kennedy, it just, she kind of said, you know, I'm, I'm not making this up, these are people that I know, and I said, Nancy, if they're your friends, it ain't name dropping. <laughs> uh, but just what an incredible, incredible life uh, that you've led. And I mean, did you, when you were married to uh, your late husband, Alan Livingston, I mean, did you uh, entertain the Beatles? Oh, yes. Oh, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> oh. do, you have a, do you have a Beatles antidote that you could share? Or? They, they were absolutely darling, all of them, and um, I think that we had the closest relationship with Paul, and uh, Ringo still lives in Beverly Hills, by the way, right. and we go to the same garage, so hi <laughs> Ringo. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they, they, they were amazing talent, and uh, one quick story, Alan came home, he never came home for lunch, and he said, Nancy, I'm coming home for lunch, I thought, oh, mm, goodness, and he said, I want to play something for you. And I said, wow, this, and he came home, and he sat me down, and he said, Nancy, in the 40s, there were the big bands. He said, in the, uh, in the 30s, the big bands. In the 40s, there was the phenomena of Frank Sinatra. The 50s, Elvis Presley. He said, it's now the 60s. He said, this is the next step. I thought, oh my goodness. So I sat there and I listened to, I want to hold your hand, I want to hold your hand. And I said, Alan, that's the worst thing I ever heard. And then he signed, uh, uh, he came home and he said, I, I signed this young man. And he said he's got, he's written, uh, he said, I'm putting out a single. And 
He said, uh, I think it's going to define the second half of the 20th century, this lyric alone. And I said, oh what's the name of it? He said, American Pie. <laughs> and I said, American Pie. <laughs> well, that's when I stopped saying anything. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, circling back uh, to Sunset Boulevard, the final scene with Gloria coming down the stairs. Were all of you on the set that day? Yes, I was uh, did there. They, did, I know films are almost never shot in sequence, but was that... That was the end. That was the end. He, yes. In other words, he crafted that was the it, last. So. That was the last yeah. shot. And it was... And, and Gloria was amazing, wasn't she? She yeah, was yeah. absolutely amazing. And that, you know, she could have gone... She did really go, but she just kept it right under that critical edge. Amazing. Yeah, and it was so Hollywood. I mean, what's more Hollywood than having Hedda Hopper chase a cop off the phone in a murder scene? <laughs> I, I just love that. Um, one thing I know you are you are working on your or your memoir, your autobiography, and we talked over lunch about the analogy of what Sunset Boulevard really was all about, and how it applied directly to a very famous movie star that you knew and observed. So in closing, what I'd like is to have Nancy read an extract from that because I think it's, it's very relevant and very powerful. Well, first of all, uh, I met Marilyn several times, and uh, it, but I, this is the last paragraph of the chapter that I wrote about her and it kind of sums up everything we've been talking about this evening. Marilyn was the quintessential result of a thousand pieces pasted together, creating a superstar movie star. Each piece was put in place by the magicians of the industry, the publicity, manipulators feeding the hungry press, the opportunities to appear on screen after sexual favors were delivered, the makeup artists, the camera crew, lighting and filming at just the right angle, the directors who understood how to use her, her the, profess the professional actors giving her the space to deliver what she could, and most of all, the history of poverty abuse, the lack of love, and trust, and family, and education, which created a vulnerability and insatiable need for the spotlight at any cost. I think of her often. I think of her with great sadness and as a tragic figure that haunts us all. And the Alan Rohde shorthand to that is, it's a noir, 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 noir world. <laughs> it sure is. At yeah, uh, any rate, Nancy, I can't tell you how much it's meant, uh, not only to me, but everyone in the audience that you came here today. And it's just wonderful. Put it together for the one and only Nancy Olson. Thank you. Thank you so much.